Good afternoon. My name is Rahul Agarwal, a GU medical oncologist at UCSF. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today, and a special thanks to Adina Bailey for helping to organize the event. Over the next few minutes, I will give a brief introduction to clinical trials, and we should hopefully have a few minutes for questions at the end. I'm gonna to briefly touch upon three topics. An overview of phase one, two, and three trials, how to interpret clinical trial results, and addressing a couple of the common questions that we receive about clinical trial participation. The three phases of clinical trials refer to the different phases of testing for a given drug or device that's being used to diagnose or treat prostate cancer. In the first phase, phase one clinical trials, we aim to determine whether a drug is safe, what is the right dose to use, does the body adequately absorb and metabolize the drug, and is there preliminary evidence of anti-tumor activity? In the second phase, we aim to test whether there's sufficient evidence of a positive treatment effect. And increasingly critical as we think about personalized care in cancer, we also try to identify the subgroups of patients that are most likely to benefit within a phase two study. In phase three, we aim to determine as compared to the current standard of care for that disease setting, does the new treatment improve clinically meaningful outcomes? It is worth saying that this is a somewhat traditional schema of drug development. Increasingly, in order to speed up timelines and enable patient access to drugs sooner, phase one trials have become larger and more focused on determination of effectiveness. In select cases, especially if there are limited standard of care options for a particular cancer type, FDA approval may even be based on expanded phase one or two trial results, a type of approval called accelerated approval. A good example of this would be the approval of pembrolizumab or Keytruda in multiple cancer types, including microsatellite high prostate cancer. Increasingly, many of our prostate cancer trials are geared towards specific subgroups of patients based on clinical, genetic, and other factors, rather than treating all comers. The advantage of this approach is that it can potentially maximize the likelihood of benefit with a particular treatment. However, there are trade-offs, including potentially slower patient enrollment and potentially excluding patients who may benefit from the treatment due to the use of imperfect selection factors. Some of the notable examples of precision oncology trials that we've seen in prostate cancer over the last few years include trials of PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer patients with mutations in the DNA repair pathway genes such as BRCA2, as well as the use of the Decipher score in localized prostate cancer to decide potentially who should get hormone therapy in combination with radiation. This slide shows an example of such a prostate cancer trial that is geared towards subgroups of patients with a particular genetic profile. This is the initial study of Olaparib, an oral PARP inhibitor medication for patients with metastatic hormone-resistant prostate cancer. Each column represented in the figure represents an individual patient. Shaded in tan on the left are all the patients whose cancers responded to treatment. And the individual rows with the colored squares show whether the patient's tumor had a mutation in a particular gene within the DNA repair pathway. As you can see clearly indicated with the red circle, nearly all of the cancer that responded to the PARP inhibitor had a mutation in one of these DNA repair genes. This type of selected trial results led to a phase three trial of elaborate, which only enrolled those patients whose tumors harbored a mutation in one of these genes and ultimately led to FDA approval of this medication. I want to spend a minute discussing interpretation of survival results among cytology trials, as this is often a pertinent topic for discussion. We all, including those of us who conduct the clinical research, have a tendency to focus too much on the median or average survival estimates of a particular treatment. In fact, it is actually important to look at the actual survival curves, what we call Kaplan-Meier curves, which estimate the probability of a treatment outcome starting from when a patient enrolls on this trial. The median or average survival is the time estimate of when half the patients have met the outcome of interest. On the left side of the screen, you see an example where the median survival estimates are nearly identical, yet clearly there is an overall benefit 
with the green curve compared to the red curve, you will see a clear separation in the curves over time, especially towards the right side. On the right side of the screen, you see the opposite. An example where the median estimates are far apart, and yet the curves come together with longer follow-up. The better statistic of how well a particular drug does is what's called the hazard ratio which is roughly speaking the area between the curves, the amount of space we can see between the two curves, which is also weighted for longer term follow-up. Lastly, I wanna address some of the great questions we commonly receive from patients who are considering enrolling on clinical trials. And hopefully we'll have time for a few more questions at the end. Number one, a question I often get, is it true that clinical trials are for only for patients who have been treated with all standard of care treatments? In fact, the majority of cancer clinical trials, including phase one studies, do not fall into this category. In clinical practice, a patient may be treated with a standard of care therapy, then enroll on a clinical trial, and then go back to standard of care. At each treatment decision point, it's important to evaluate all the potential treatment options, both those as part of a clinical trial as well as those that are FDA approved standard treatment options. Whether a particular trial is right for you at the current junction in time will depend on many factors that you'll be able to discuss with your clinician. A second question that I commonly get is, how much is this study gonna cost? This is a great question that I hear from patients all the time. And I think it's a really important consideration, especially, especially when you factor in not only dollar costs, but time costs, the amount of time it takes to come to a center to participate on a clinical trial and that often can be not trivial. The good news is that we try very hard to make sure commercial insurance is only billed for those items that are considered standard of care, and everything else, including the trial medications, is covered by the study. I'm also hopeful that one of the important insights COVID-19 has taught us is that we can vastly expand the use of telemedicine for our clinical trial participants, making it much more accessible for them to participate and, and cut down on the amount of travel associated costs to come to UCSF. And hopefully this pattern that we've seen emerge during the pandemic with clinical trial participation will continue well beyond when it's over. And with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention.